Hello, ladies and gentlemen, this is Luke Johnson from Noetic, the intelligent social media platform, which you can download for your iPhone and Droid devices or go over to noetic.app to create an account and join us in the discussion session so you can enter into debate with Sophie and I about Blake's The Marriage of Heaven and Hell. We're back with part two in our discussion series, and I believe that Sophie wants to begin our session today with a clarification from last time. Yes, in the previous episode, <laughs> previous podcast, uh, it ended with the first part of the poem, uh, uh, the argument, and in the end, uh, Blake is saying, without contraries is no progression, and uh, attraction and repulsion, reason and energy, love and hate are necessary to human existence. And he, he, it ends with, good is heaven, evil is hell. And uh, as we, I think we talked about the psychiatrist uh, Carl Jung uh, in the first uh, podcast of this series, and he just, I just wanted to say that he wrote a book on this specific subject of the opposites uh, and the marriage of, uh, of the opposites, which is named the conjuncture in uh, alchemy. And uh, his book is called uh, uh, Mysterium Conjuncturis. Oh, so, yes. Latin. Oh, yes. Do you have that book? Yes, I have it. Uh, it's it's translated in French, and there are actually three books, uh, uh, two by Jung and one by um, uh, his assistant, uh, Ma Marie-Louise von Franz. Uh, I didn't realize, you know, uh, for a variety of different reasons, I've done some deep Jung research. I'm not I, I'm not, Sophie knows a lot more about Jung than I do, but I've had to go deeper into Jung. And I just, the collected writings of Jung, there's, I, there's so many volumes. Like, yes. I, I, I believe I bought, I have a physical copy of volume 10, but like they're, they're kind of pricey, but it's like um, amazing. In, and I, I've been doing some work out of volume 12. For those who are interested, I use a website called scribd.com and for like $10 a month, you can get access to audiobooks and these papers and books that Sophie and I are talking about. Because I find the Jung stuff to be infinitely fascinating, but like you really have to have a lot of money to buy all these books. How, how do you get around it in France? Uh, some of them are translated uh, in French, but it's not exactly uh, the same. Um, uh, how do you say it in English? the same uh, separation into books than in the English right. uh, version. Uh, it's been translated by a Jungian, uh, French Jungian scholar. Uh, I, maybe I, uh, I don't have it right now, but it's on the, in the other room. Are they, are they as expensive in France as they are in America, because each volume I found is like something like thirty or forty dollars. Uh, I think it's less expensive than this. Uh, if I take one book of Mysterium Conjunctionis uh, in French, uh, because there are free books, but if I take only one volume, uh, it's. Uh, Yes, it's twenty six euros. Yeah, yeah. And it's uh, translated by. Um, oh, I'm looking for his name. He used to do uh, shows uh, at the French uh, culture radio. While you're looking at that, I want to ask you this question. I'm curious. Is are you an outlier in terms of your interest in Jung in France, or is Jung widely taught and read in France? I haven't like how no. how much inf no he's not he's not um, oh okay no it's translated by Etienne Pierrot it's it's not the same person I, that, as I thought uh, but no in French Jung is not very popular uh, in France Freud is very popular. Uh, 
but uh, not you. Interesting. Interesting. Well, let's, uh, I could talk, you know, I have a lot of Jung stuff that I want to talk about. So maybe like once we get done with some Blake, we can talk some Jung because I have tons of Jung stuff I want to talk about. But uh, is there anything else you want to say about the end of the argument before we jump into the next part of Blake's uh, poem, the, the Voice of the Devil? No, I think we can start the, the second part, second episode. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, you know, I kind of, just to give people a sense, of, we didn't talk about this, but I was thinking maybe one of us could read the, uh, read the, read the voice of the devil. And one of us could read the memorable fancy part. Do you want to read it or do you want me to read it? Uh, as you prefer. I... I'll read the voice of the devil and then you can do memorable fancy. How about that? Okay. All right. All right. The voice of the devil. All Bibles or sacred codes have been the cause of the following errors. One, that man has two real existing principles, viz. a body and a soul. Two, that energy called evil is alone from the body, and that reason called good is alone from the soul. Three, that God will torment man in eternity for following his energies, but the following contraries to these are true. One, man has no body distinct from his soul. For that called body is a portion of soul discerned by the five senses, the chief inlets of soul in this age. Two, energy is the only life and is from the body, and reason is the bound or outward circumference of energy. Three, energy is eternal delight. Those who restrain desire do so because theirs is weak enough to be restrained, and the restrainer or reason usurps its place and governs the unwilling. And being restrained, it, it by degrees becomes passive till it is only the shadow of desire. The history of this is written in Paradise Lost, and the governor or reason is called Messiah, and the original archangel or possessor of the command of the heavenly host is called the devil, or Satan, and his children are called sin and death. But in the book of Job, Milton's Messiah is called Satan. For this history has been adopted by both parties. It indeed appeared to reason as if desire was cast out, but the devil's account is that the Messiah fell and formed a heaven of what he stole from the abyss. This is shown in the gospel where he prays to the Father to send the comforter or desire that reason may have ideas to build on. That Jehovah the Bible being no other than he who dwells in flaming fire, know that after Christ's death he became Jehovah. But in Milton the Father is destiny, the son of ratio of the five senses, and the Holy Ghost vacuum. Note, the reason Milton wrote in fetters when he wrote of angels and God and at liberty when of devils in hell is because he was a true poet and of the devil's party without knowing it. Man, we could talk about just this section all day today, but that is uh, the voice of the devil part of Blake's The Marriage of Heaven and Hell. And I'll let Sophie respond with my, to my recitation. Yes. So I, I read the memorab a memorable fancy part. Well, I think we'll do uh, that after we discuss the uh, No, you want me to... Okay, you, you want me to discuss this part. Yes, yeah, so, let's discuss this um, part, yeah. Yeah. Um, the first part of this part about men having two uh, real existing principles, body and soul, and... Uh, which Blake is correcting by his own view that uh, body is not distinct from soul. It's the, it, I think it's directly inspired by Swedenborg uh, because it was his opinion as well that the body was a, uh, a part of the soul and not distinct from it. I, I'm still early in my knowledge of Swedenborg, so I don't know exactly the doctrine propounded in Swedenborg about this particular uh, theology of the body and the soul. The only thing that I have to say about that at first, you know, I, I worry that like a lot of our conceptions of biblical theology is influenced by Greek metaphysics, uh, the, the synchronization of them. But if you really go back into the scripture, which I dug up, Blake is not wrong. At first I was like, well, Blake, I don't know if that's fair to say that there are these two antagonizing principles of the body and the soul and they're competing, but just, uh, 
and it's deeper than this, but just a cursory survey of scripture, first Thessalonians five twenty three, the ESV. Um, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then again, in Matthew 10, 28, and do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. So what I had to say about that was, uh, it does seem to be the case that body and soul are treated distinctly and separately within, within the Bible. But then we have this other entity, which Blake is not really addressing here so much of spirit and how that interacts between soul and body. But it, I don't think he's necessarily wrong that there are these two real existing principles. And, and maybe Swedenborg was reacting to that and refashioning that as well. Yes, there is a philosopher which I love, which I really like, an exist Christian existentialist philosopher uh, whose name was uh, um, Nikolai Berdyev. He was a Russian uh, philosopher who em emigrated to France in the 20th century. And uh, he wrote a lot about the spirit and... Uh, I think he had in mind these three parts uh, conceptions conception of human the human being. Um, also, I have another thing to say about uh, this affirmation by uh, Blake uh, uh, when he says that the, uh, a portion of the of soul is discerned by the five senses, the chief inlets of soul in this age. And uh, it also made me think about Jung because uh, the way he talks about the self, he he says that as if this um, actually it's an interpretation by um, uh, Edward Edinger, Edinger, who we talked about in the previous episode, who was a Jungian uh, scholar. He interpreted Jung's uh, concept of self as uh, as if uh, it's you know a telescope you are looking uh, at the space using a telescope and you have the the two dimensions of space and one dimension of time you have the space time and the it's as if the self was the organ uh, which we use to uh, perceive space space time and I don't know how to explain it clearly, but it's... Uh, I don't think uh, anyone does. Immanuel Kant tried. <laughs> but yeah, it's a very yeah. difficult concept to, to, to wrap one's mind around. It, it, Jung's idea was every time you have a, a quaternity, like space-time is a quaternity, you have three dimensions of space and one dimension of time. And every time you have a quaternity, it's... Uh, it's a symbol of the self, and uh, and so uh, the self is what we we see the the, the world uh, we see the world through the self. And like you said, uh, uh, Kant, Jung was very much inspired by Kant, Kant. And you know what's interesting is that there's a relationship between Kant and Swedenborg as re as well. Um, not a lot of people know this. I actually did a recording of it because I was so surprised that this hadn't been recorded for posterity. Um, you can go to the Noetic YouTube channel and check it out. But uh, Kant was so moved by the mystical experiences of Swedenborg that he felt compelled to address a whole book to it. It's called Dreams of a Spirit Seer. And I believe he wrote it earlier in his career before he got into the critiques or whatever. But he takes... The dream, he takes the dream interpretations and the prophecies of Emanuel Swedenborg very seriously and tries to understand what's going on with them philosophically. So we do have this trifecta of, of thinkers that are all interacting here with Jung, Blake, and Kant, kind of and, and, and ultimately traceable back to Swedenborg. Yes, and their common points also is that they are interested in dream interpretation. Yeah, I mean, this is 
how could you not be right? I mean, this is the thing for a long time. I eschewed like the, taking the idea of dream interpretation seriously. But as I began to take the Bible more seriously, the Bible is filled with countless episodes of dream interpretation. What's interesting is that we didn't stop interpreting dreams within respectable ac academia. We just started attributing new concepts to them. Like with Freud, we started attributing things like uh, sexualized concepts to them rather than things like famine. So it's, it's, it's interesting that you can trace dream interpretation that goes on within modern psychoanalysis all the way back to the, the Bible, if not earlier. Yes, the most famous one is Jacob's dreams, in which yes. he sees the ladder and the angels, uh, which are going up and down. Yeah, the Jacob's. And uh, Joseph, who became second in command of Egypt, uh, was renowned for his ability as a dream interpreter. So I guess what I would say to Christians and to academics who are inclined to think outside the box is that uh, dream interpretation is a real thing and condoned by God in some instances. So, yeah, not, do not ignore our dreams. Uh, I, I, the, I'm trying to think about some other things that I thought was interesting here. The way that Blake talks about the soul, it, it kind of made me think that he rather than viewing it sort of dualistically, that he's got some sort of emergent materialistic worldview, at least coming from the, the voice of the devil. Um, but that we don't necessarily see this in scripture. So I don't know exactly how I would describe the interactive nature of body and soul in Blake, but uh, it, it, it definitely seems to be not dualistic and to be some sort of emer some, some variety of emergentism. Like there's so many different categories of this. I, I don't, have you ever thought about what it might precisely be? I'll, I'll, I'll give us some examples of um, what, what might there might be out there. Um, in my opinion, it's quite the opposite. Oh, let uh, me hear. Let me hear. I, I think, yes, it's some, um, it's rather a monism than a dualism, but I think uh, Blake uh, see the material world as something produced by the soul. He's and more this... spiritualist than a materialist, in my yeah. opinion. Yeah, I mean, pinning it down, I think pinning it down would be absolutely fascinating. I mean, just some of the big views. There's stuff, there's a view called interactionist dualism, epiphenomenalism, psychophysic parallelism, non-reductive physicalism. And that's just a handful. I could go on and on about the other views that are in vogue in philosophy. But I, I just want to point out that he, that it would probably be a worthwhile philosophical endeavor to figure out where Blake is in all of this. Um, do, do you have anything else to say about this uh, point one of uh, uh, Blake's uh, uh, The Voice of the Devil? Or can, could we go on with point two? Yeah. There, that... there, there is a list of arguments which is of a widespread religious opinion which he's contradicting. Right. Uh, go, yeah, yeah. Go ahead to point two. Uh, so point two, the the common uh, opinion uh, which Blake think is wrong is that uh, energy called evil is alone from the body, and that reason called good is alone from the soul. And uh, so it seems to me that uh, it's the same concepts as the Dionysian and the the Apollonian is in Nietzsche's uh, uh, The Birth of Tragedy, um, that uh, the... Um, yeah, we have this like Dionysian bestial frenzy that is ultimately alleviate, alleviated by the Apollinian dream world. Yes. And this is like the balancing of the human psyche 
And uh, it's, a, it's a fascinating book. I highly recommend The Birth of Tragedy. And uh, what Blake is saying is that it's not really... Uh, the, the Dionysian does not come uh, only from the body and not it also comes from the soul. And it's also the same uh, for the Apollonian reason uh, part, which is both spreading from the soul and the body. So it's there, there is not uh, a separation uh, between a body and soul in relation to these two, uh, these two, uh, how could we call them, these two principles. Yeah, it's like you got your... You got your jelly and my peanut butter. You got my, your peanut butter and my jelly there. It's, it's all mixed up. And, you know, Blake is right. You know, I, I was skeptical again. I was like, ah, is it really so simplistic to reduce like the commonly held religious belief? But again, if we go back to the Bible, Galatians 5, 16 through 17, the ESV, but I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh for the desires of the flesh are against the spirit and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. So it's pretty clear there that there is the separation, at least as it's talked about in the Bible. Now, there are other instances that, that complicate the view, but at least from Galatians, I think we have, uh, you know, we th I think we can see what Blake is reacting to with the, from the voice of the devil. And how, inter how interesting it is that the voice of the devil and all, uh, th this prerogative, this perspective is so neatly aligning with, with Nietzsche, you know? Yes. And also we have these conceptions of the unconscious. Uh, some people divide the unconscious into two parts, the subconscious and the um, uh, supraconscious. And they say that the uh, normal consciousness is between the two. So the subconscious would be uh, hell or underground consciousness, whereas the supraconscious would be if would be heaven, in uh, using Blake's uh, metaphors or concepts. But some people like Jung would say that. Uh, Actually, both the subconscious and the supraconscious would be uh, uh, not separated, but both a part of the unconscious. And maybe if we use this, the concept of spirit as well, m maybe the, uh, spirit contains both uh, energy and reason. Yeah, we'll get into that a little bit when we talk about the, the, the Miltonic influence that is referenced here when he talks about how in Job, I, I think that was really the only thing I really struggled with. I thought was the most confusing part of the poem was trying to understand what exactly is going on with reason in the book of Job. I didn't have an opportunity to read the book of Job in preparation for this, but I, I generally have a feeling of it and might be worth revealing reviewing some of the particulars as we get to that part. But let's look at these following contraries that the devil is claiming are true, if, if that's okay. Okay. Oh, well, I mean, do we want to say anything about the third one? I mean, I, I think it's pretty obvious that God will, I mean, I wanted to be like, is this really true that God will torment man in eternity? Well, you know, there's a lot of Bibles, there's a lot of Bible passages that say that that will occur. But not only that, the converse is that man will dwell in bliss in eternity. So I don't think Blake is wrong about these common conceptions from sacred books. Now, I tend to agree with them, but Blake is offering, offering a dissenting view here from the perspective of the devil. Yes, I think it's important to read the, the last part, uh, which is God will torment man in eternity for following his energies. And I think that's what Blake is insisting um, is that in his opinion following the energy which uh, we could say it's um, uh, I, for, we will see this in the rest of the poem but uh, I think Blake is thinking about inspiration and the poetic genius 
when he talks about the energies and uh, the artistic uh, inspir ins how do you say this in english uh, inspiration yeah 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 what's interesting is we when we get to that part if you look into the etymology of genius uh if you go back far enough it, it's connected to genii like like a genie and the genie is like an attending spirit and interestingly enough throughout the bible it tells us not to entertain familiar spirits and it makes you really wonder what men of genius are actually doing uh if they're in entertaining spirit guides not unlike uh, what jung did right jung had a spirit guide that we, is revealed in the red book called philemon and socrates socrates as well yeah didn't he, he, yeah what what did he had a well, it was it was called his daemon wasn't it yes yeah that's how that's what he called it and uh some some people like uh jung's friend uh um who was a french uh scholar about uh esoteric islam uh henri corbin i don't know if you you've heard about him no i'm and learning so, i'm learning so much from you sophie this is good and uh, he wrote a lot about the concepts of the angel, uh, which would be the celestial counterpart of the, the earthly human. And maybe the angel, which is described in this uh, Islamic text, which he's uh, studying, is the same uh, entity than uh, Jung's uh, Philemon and... Uh, Socrates diamond. <laughs> it's interesting to think about. It's interesting to think about. We'll get into the, because there is a little bit of angelology that's required here because Blake makes the claim that Satan was once an archangel. And that is sort of true. Like he's called the most anointed cherubim, the, the cherub that covereth the throne of God. But archangels, depending on the tradition, even if you're Catholic or Protestant, uh, Catholics and Protestants have different names for the archangels. Like I think, I think Protestants only really recognize Michael, whereas um, as a as an angel by name, an archangel by name. Whereas like Catholics will recognize Gabriel and Raphael, and because of the other books that are part of the Catholic Bible, Uriel and uh, Jeremiel and several others. Um, it's a fascinating thing. Um, and then there are archangels in Islam. There are arch there are archangels in in uh, in in Satanism as well. So it's it's a fascinating thing to determine what exactly an archangel is. But let's get to the where the the following contraries to these are true. He says man has no body distinct from his soul, for that called body is a portion of the soul discerned by the five senses, the chief inlets of soul in this age. And two, energy is the only life and is from the body and reason is the bound or outward circumference of energy. So the only thing I, you know, this is where we get a lot of this talk that feeds into the doors of perception, you know, where we have to cleanse out our, these portals and see the world anew. I thought that was interesting the way he used inlets. And um, the other thing is he's from the perspective of the devil, the, the de reason, which is going to be, Milton's Messiah, according to Blake, and maybe even Milton himself, if you take certain passages, passages uh, seriously enough, is this limiting force upon the, the, the true life force of, of, of creation. And that reason is in some sense, reason with a capital R, conscience, uh, gubernatorial roles from God, like these are ultimately for the weak. And, and so, so Satan is trying to get rid to dethrone reason, but we'll see, he doesn't really dethrone it entirely. He actually ends up trying to pervert it and using it in its own way. Yes. Uh, <laughs> maybe I can come on later because I, I don't have anything to say about it yet. Okay. Let's keep going. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, energy is eternal delight. So here's where we get kind of this Nietzschean communication. 
Those who restrain desire do so because theirs is weak enough to be restrained, and the restrainer or reason usurps its place and governs the unwilling. And being restrained, it by degrees becomes passive till it is the only, shadow, only the shadow of desire. The history of this is written in Paradise Lost, and the governor or reason is called Messiah. And just, I think, it, I, I, might, I think the Milton reference is, it should be brought out here. Um, so we all know what we're talking about. Uh, this is from uh, a, a paper from uh, the, an anthology class at central.edu. I'll, I'll have it. It says, after the fall, Adam and Eve are no longer ruled by their reason. As with Satan, they experience a reversal in their status. They once had all the freedom they could want as long as they followed God's one order but they presumed to make themselves higher and ate of the fruit for completely selfish reasons. So it's not that reason, uh, this is me talking, it's not that reason wasn't involved, it's just that the reason became egocentric and not objective like a Kantian. They lost their freedom and were forced out of the garden because they, were against their, it, they went against their nature. God made them perfect, but they presumed to become more than perfect as corresponds with Satan's reason. The way they thought was reversed as well. In the beginning, they used their reason first and made their decisions that way. In book nine, reason is overcome by the other faculties of the mind. And this is Milton, a direct quote, to sensual appetite who from beneath usurping over sovereign reason claimed superior sway, 1129 to 1130. Adam and Eve gave way to lust and desire, ignoring right reason. They became even more like Satan through their selfishness and lust. Satanic reason is one of the driving forces in Paradise Lost. Milton uses Satan's concept of raising himself higher to provide logical cause for both the fall of Satan and of Adam and Eve. By masking his reason with a silver sliver of truth, Satan is able to manipulate the fall of man. Milton draws a correlation between the reason of Satan and the logic of mankind by using Adam and Eve as examples of Satan's influence on the human race. So, Yes. There's a lot, yeah, there's a lot to say here, but, but essentially why I was saying that it's Nietzschean is that the way that Blake is talking here through the voice of the devil is that it's a lot like the, 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 the paradigm that Nietzsche uses in the genealogy of morals where morality is invented in order to justify the ineffectiveness of the weak and ultimately to overtake the strong who are more in touch with their, um, uh, uh, striving and overcoming and the spirit of the Ubermensch. So that's why it seemed very Nietzschean to me. And what he's talking about in terms of, of Milton here is that the only way that we could get a fall to happen is if there was a twisting and a perversion of reason so that it could be employed by the egocentric faculties in order to call the fall, cause the fall of both Satan and Adam himself. Yes, I have a lot of things to say uh, about you, this part. Yeah, you go, girl. I was talking for a while. Uh, yes, so I think it's important to to speak about uh, Job. I, is he talking about Job just after this? Yes, he said uh, in the book of Job, Milton's Messiah is called Satan. And um, in the previous uh, podcasts, uh, I made a mistake because uh, I said that uh, the uh, uh, picture of uh, the um, uh, illustrations of the book of Job by William Blake uh, was in the book by uh, Judy uh, Singer, uh, Blake, you and the collective unconscious, uh, June Singer, sorry. But it's not true. I've seen it uh, actually in an article about uh, the, the songwriter Leonard Cohen and uh, the uh, comparison between Le Leonard Cohen and William Blake. And uh, I think uh, the psychological uh, interpretation of this part uh, is related to this interpretation of the book of Job, which I mentioned last time, uh, that at the beginning of the story, uh, Job was um, not playing the musical instruments, so he was not following his energies. And as a consequence, he became um, 
uh, his it's like his as if his soul was uh, dry as if his he lost his inspiration his uh, poetic genius and uh, so that i think that's what william blake is saying here that uh, if you don't uh, follow your inspiration and you don't create uh, art or not only art but if you don't have a, an artistic way of life then the inspiration will dry dry out and uh, you you will become like a robot and uh, only living according to uh, um, what seems reasonable and uh, uh, according to uh, practical uh, considerations. Yeah, then that gets into the note about how he says that Milton was in fetters, right? And when he was, when he was writing about the angels, he was imprisoned. But when he was writing about the devils in Paradise Lost, he was, he was actually doing the work of the devil. And I think what Play, Blake is trying to say there is that um, reason was sh shackling uh, Milton when he talked about celestial, heavenly things. And it wasn't until he, was could, he could really let loose when he was talking about demons because he didn't have to be, uh, so in your terminology, roboticized by the Messiah of reason. And I yeah, if, if we think about the religious uh, analogies, uh, the religious interpretation of this, I don't think that, uh, and it's going to be, uh, uh, Blake is going to, to give a, uh, a conclusion to this problem at the end of the poem, the problem of where uh, the Jesus Christ uh, belong. Uh, is he, can we, could we really say that his reason uh, and it, in, in his, uh, Blake is going to answer, answer this question at the end of the poem. Yeah, I, I, I haven't done a full breakdown at the end of the poem, so I can't, I can't really speak to that. I'm hesitant to say yes or no either way. Um, you know, <clears throat> the, my temptation to say that Christ is just reason seems to align a little too well with the Enlightenment project. And I think like what's going on with the Bible and the New Testament far exceeds what's going on in the Enlightenment project. You know, I mean, you're, you're in France. I mean, you're familiar with, isn't the story where they went into a church and enthroned the goddess yeah. of wisdom? Well, how does it go? Yes. Jung is talking about this in Aeon, uh, in the collective works. Uh, I, I've learned this from Jung. I, I didn't know this before. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's uh, so I'm, I'm a little bit hesitant to be like Milton if Milton really did hold this view to say that uh, Christ was reason, not that Christ is unreasonable, um, not, not at all. So I have to get a little nuanced with my interpretation of that. One thing I wanted to point out about this, uh, uh, um, the Job, uh, Milton's Messiah and Satan. Line, but in the book of Job, Milton's Messiah is called Satan. Um, oh, and above it, his children are called sin and death. I thought I was like, what is Satan has children called sin and death? Where is this coming from? And so I did a, I did a little. I had a chance to review my notes from last time. I looked at this a little bit, and at the Met Museum, there is a painting that everyone should check out called Satan, Sin, and Death. Death and Sin Met by Satan on His Return from Earth, 1792 to 95 by James Barry Irish. And, it, and it's taken, apparently, from Paradise Lost, book 2, 630 to 814, and it describes Satan's arrival at the gates of hell after being cast, down, cast from heaven. Satan finding death, guarding the entrance, menaces that skeletal form as the bare-breasted figure of sin intercedes. He does not recognize this ghastly opponent conceived incestually with sin as his son. 
This drawing made as Barry planned a series of large etchings inspired by Milton's Paradise Lost demonstrates the artist's deep engagement with the aesthetic concepts of Sublime. So uh, it is in the Miltonic uh, tradition where sin is this offspring of Satan or death is this offspring of Satan that is conceived with sin, I should say. Did, had, have you ever seen, heard this concept or seen such no, paintings? No, I haven't. Um, I had something to say about, um, I'll, I'll share, I want to show you the, the, the painting. I'll send it to you in our chat so you can take a quick look at it. It looks a li it, it looks like the, uh, it, it looks like something Blake would have done. Yes. I, I just wanted to, to say that Blake is very much, uh, uh, the, in the tradition of the romantic movement is an, even if he's a bit before the, the romantic movement, but, uh, as a, he's, a uh, reacting against uh, the Enlightenment uh, ideas, and uh, I, I think it's his um, ideas are more uh, in this reaction against uh, reason than it's not ex exactly. Uh, it's it's as if he equates uh, traditional uh, morality with the Enlightenment ideas, uh, a bit like uh, a theologian like um, uh, Saint Thomas, uh, who was a, a rationalist in the Christian tradition. Yeah, it's been a while since I've looked at Aquinas' morality stuff. I know he was deeply influenced by Aristotle, so I'm not sure if he just like took the Aristotelian conception of the mean and Christianized it. Uh, it's been a long time since I've looked at him. But uh, yeah, there's going to be a lot of... Th it's hard to say what biblical morality is. It's, it's simultaneously simple and complex. I mean, I think it's distilled enough down to the great commandments that Jesus gave which seems to look a, light, a lot like the categorical imperative of Kant, loving the neighbor as thyself and loving God uh, with all your heart, mind, and soul, or, or something to that effect. Uh, but then we have, we have, we have morale, morality for different epochs in the Bible. So, you know, we have the Ten Commandments and we have uh, prescriptions for feast days and calendars and what to do on the Sabbath. It, it really raises a large question about how much of that Old Testament law is fulfilled in the somewhat simple commandments of Christ in the New Testament. A lot of people argue that they aren't completely fulfilled, that they're still in effect. So it's kind of a raging debate in theological circles to this day. Yes, yes, we could, uh, we could uh, start a long discussion about this, but <laughs> we would. Uh... Yeah, that would. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't, I don't pretend to have the answers to it. Uh... But I think Nietzsche, Nietzsche, uh, Nietzsche's book of about the gene, uh, the two books actually uh, about uh, beyond good and evil, and the genealogy of moral, uh, morals. Uh, is really going deeper about this subject. <laughs> most definitely, most definitely. You know, I, you know, my intention for talking about these things is not for what we say to be a comprehensive analysis of, of, of Blake or Milton or Nietzsche or whatever. But hopefully, this uh, anyone who's listening to this is being like is is seeing all these different influences and interconnections. And we use this as like a jumping off point for their own research. So that's all I really try to do with our discussions here today. Now I got the thing that really got me and I, I'm not sure I, I completely understood it. And I definitely had some objections to it was this part 
It indeed appeared to reason as if desire was cast out, but the devil's account is that the Messiah fell and formed a heaven of what he stole from the abyss. And then, so I'll just stop right there and then I'll go into the next part. So with the story of Job, and I had, I, I briefly had a chance to read a summary of it because I'm, I mean, I just started Deuteronomy this morning on my third read. And it's been a while since I've read Job, which is, in my opinion, probably the best book of the Bible, but I, it's been over a year since I've read it. But the deal with Job is, you know, if, for those of you who don't know, this was a, this was a man, very, a, a righteous man, very blessed by God. And Satan and God enter into a wager where Satan says to God, hey, look, the only reason why Job is so pious is because you have rewarded him so much. Give me the opportunity to take everything away from him, and let's see if he remains faithful. And God says, okay, you can, you can do all sorts of things to him, but you can't kill him, okay? So Job suffers these terrible trials. He loses everything, his family. Uh, breaks out in boils, his friends and his wife and everybody want him to curse God, but he refuses to curse God. And ultimately it culminates. um, Job is, you can tell Job wants an answer for the nature of the suffering that he's going through. And God appears out of whirlwind and goes on and on. And just like, who are you? Who are you to demand me to explain anything? Were you there at the creation of the earth? the foundations of the earth. I'm paraphrasing, obviously. You need to go read this for yourself. And Job, rather than demand God to be reasonable and rational, is content that he's not going to have that answer on this side of eternity. And because Job surrenders his submission to reason, God ultimately rewards Job and restores everything to an even greater degree. So, I think that's what we're seeing here when he's talking about that, uh, that the Messiah fell and formed a heaven of what he stole from the abyss. Um, this is my take on it, is that reason is no longer, in the case of Job, at work. It's a, it's a completely unreasonable thing from the human perspective. Now, this is not something I believe. I just, I'm saying this is what I think Blake is getting at. And then what he actually ends up doing is providing Job with worldly comfort, not unlike what, you know, what, what Satan is trying to do all the time through these evil energies of the Bible. So we have this inversion that seems to happen in the book of Job. And so that we, don't, we can't really have the book of Job and the Messiah being reason ruling over us all the time. Yes, I would have a, another interpretation of this line, but sure, go ahead. F- first, uh, I think we read the book of Job together. I think we did. I think we did a long time ago, maybe three years ago or something. Yes, and uh, I have a, a psychological interpretation of of this. Sure, go. Uh, yeah. If you, we took uh, actually Jungian's uh, concepts, uh, we could say that. Uh, all the great, uh, how could we say? We can say the the a person who is a saint, you know, a great saint like uh, Saint Francis or uh, Saint John of Arc. Um, these kind of people, uh, they they were uh, inspired by. Uh, uh, we could say the Holy Spirit. They were very pa- passionate people, and they they were not following reason mostly. And uh, we can wonder if this energy that inspired them uh, could be from uh, this, uh, as Blake says, uh, this. Uh, heaven which the Messiah stole from the abyss if we we say the abyss is the unconscious uh, we could say that the energy of the great 
sense comes from the same place as uh, uh, the um, the unrestrained desires. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and and what, you know, when Jesus says he's going to send the comforter, perhaps that's what that is, at least what Blake is saying from the perspective of the vantage of the, of, of, of the devil. So, and it says that, or desire that reason may have ideas to build on. And we could also say that people who are rationalists, uh, who completely reject uh, the emotional and instinct, instinctive uh, functions of human being, of the the human being. These people don't realize how much they are influenced by their inst instincts and emotions. And, right. Uh, they they make a separation which actually doesn't exist. It's it's not even even if you take a, uh, take a materialist. Uh, a point of view is not working like this in the brain. You can't have a, a, a processes of uh, reas reasoning without uh, emotions and instincts. You don't have such things as uh, pure reason. It's, it doesn't exist. Well, what I you know it, all this talk about the dichotomy between reason and bodily pleasures and stuff like that. I mean, and how ultimately it used to something about like saints and how it doesn't seem that they're doing anything rational, like for it, or just like the disciples, right? When Jesus called the fishermen to be his disciples, they're like, sure, let me just like completely qu quit my career and follow maybe this guy who's the Messiah. Like none of this is rational unless we want to talk about there being like in a Kierkegaardian sense, something super rational, something, a, a rationale rationality that is of a higher level of consciousness, a spiritual rationality. Because I, if you think about it, if you really are convinced that Christ is the son of God, even though from the perspective of the world, you're breaking rationality by leaving your career behind to follow a wonder worker. Um, if this truly is who the son of God is, it's the most rational thing in the world to do. So there might be different forms of rationality at play. Yes, I, in one of the comments I made on the poem, which on, we used a, a Google Doc, uh, we, a Google document to, to study this uh, poem before this discussion, and I, I thought about Kierkegaard, about his three stages of religious development. We have the uh, aesthetic stage, the ethical stage and the religious stage and he had this uh, concept of the uh, suspension of uh, the teleological yeah yes and i wonder if um, it's a bit the same as what blake is talking about that sometimes you that as if there was a, a superior reason and sense of morality which from the point of view of the common uh, ethical and reason would be uh, unreasonable and maybe and maybe di diabolical or uh, not in uh, conformity with uh, with the moral codes. Right, right, right. So I mean, I have some sympathy for saying that reason, in a certain sense, would be this roboticizing. Uh, uh, principality or principle within the human spirit. So I can, I can relate to that. And maybe this comes back into what spirit actually is. Maybe the soul has its own form of reason and may, maybe the spirit has a different form of reason. And we're not really getting uh, a distinction. Between, we're getting a distinction between soul and body, but we're not getting the spirit addressed too much. So we'll leave that open for conversation. Something I thought was interesting here in this passage too, um, the Jehovah of the Bible being no other than he who dwells in flaming fire, know that after Christ's death, he became Jehovah. Now, this is, this is a big deal. <laughs> uh, a, uh, a uh, Jehovah did not just dwell in flaming fire. 
uh, Jehovah takes on a multitude of different uh, uh, theophanies throughout the Old Testament. He appears in cloud. He appears, I mean, even to Moses, Moses is allowed to see his backside. Um, there's a variety of different manifestations. So he's not just a flaming fire. He's talking about the burning bush, I suppose. So that, I, that's, that's interesting. And, uh, <clears throat> but this other thing, know that after Christ's death, he became Jehovah. Well, this, is, this really throws a monkey wrench into a lot of Trinitarian thinking. We tend to think about Christ sitting at the right hand of, father, of the Father in heaven, not that the Father was in heaven, left his throne, came down to earth, then came, went back up and shot into heaven, that you know, there is a separate person, that there isn't a total fusion of, of Christ with the, with the Father. They are all part of the Godhead, but kind of different avatars of it. It was just a a remarkably simplistic way of talking about it, but I thought it was interesting that he would say such a thing. And when we talk about fire, we we immediately uh, we should not forget about the Holy Spirit because uh, the Holy Spirit is symbolized by fire as well. It, is it? I, I haven't looked into it a while. I know it, it's talked about how it descends like a dove. And I know it, in the upper room, there was the kind of the, the, the windows and the doors blew open and descended upon the apostles. I'm trying to think about the episodes yes, in, of fire. In, uh, how do you say that in English, the Pentecost? The... Yeah. When the, the disciples received the Holy Spirit, there were flames, uh, tongues, do you say tongues of flames, which nice. came unto them? Let me look into this. How's the Holy Spirit? You keep, keep talking. I'm going to look into this a little bit. Yes, it, it's something which is very uh, troubling. Uh, if you... When you read the Bible, the, sem- the symbols which are used can be a source of uh, um, maybe an uh, emotional uh, reaction. Especially, imagine if you are an atheist person who was not raised in the Christian religion and you just read the Bible. You, you would see the same symbols used for heaven and hell, actually. Yeah, uh, this, yeah. You I would d- see fire used for hell, but also for the Holy Spirit. And Yeah, this- I, ju- I just found a verse that backs up what you're saying, if, just so I can interject here. It's Matthew 3.11. I, John the Baptist said, is talking about, this is, he says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So Yes. And uh, the, uh, uh, a scholar, religious scholar, which is not, who is not very uh, orthodox, uh, even if he, she is from the Orthodox Church, her interpretation is not very orthodox. Uh, she's uh, named uh, Annick de Susan Allen. She's still alive. And she made uh, her own interpretation of the Bible. And uh, she, she says that... Uh, it's, it, actually, she says that it's not her own interpretation, but her the way she talks about it is not uh, the orthodox interpretation. And she often talks about three baptisms. She says that in all traditions, there are three baptisms. Uh, baptisms, baptism of water, which would be the first baptism. Baptism and fire of fire, which would be the second baptism. By the way, and I love how you say fire. I always have. <laughs> fire. Fire. <laughs> I, I don't know if I pronounce it well. No, no, it's great. The, the, I, I'm not even looking at your face right now because I'm looking at my notes, but whenever I've ever heard you say the word fire, your, your eyes light up. 
<laughs> and the third one would be the skull baptism. What, what uh, what's the third baptism? The skull, or um, you know, S um, skull. Like yes, like the... I I'm I'm searching for the the correct word, uh, in English. Uh, you know the. Like Golgotha. Uh, yeah, the Golgotha bap baptism, and uh, so Christ had, according to Annick de Souzenel, uh, Christ has lived the three baptisms. Uh, the first is the water baptism, which he experienced with John the Baptist, uh, and the second would be his whole. Uh, uh, how do you say this? The his whole uh, pu public life, where he uh, where he performed uh, mirac mirac miracles, and the skull baptism would be the Golgotha, his passion and death. Is that a is that a blood baptism when you talk about the skull and Golgotha? Because we are made anew by the shedding of Christ's blood is is it when you say skull is that synonymous with a blood a, a blood no, type of baptism i'm not i'm not sure that's what she meant mm. um I, I think it's uh uh really related to what happened when he died and maybe uh it's because she's from the orthodox tradition as well the Orthodox Christian uh, think a lot about uh, Christ descending in uh, uh, in uh, hell after he died before the resurrection. It's uh, an episode which is important to Orthodox Christians. Oh, it's important for Protestants too, even though they don't know it. A lot of people don't understand that he descended into Abraham's bosom. It's talked about into in Ephesians, which is a compartment of hell where the because no man could ascend into heaven before christ came so you had a lot of the old testament saints like abraham and and moses who had not been uh had not been given the chance to uh have the blood atonement of jesus christ so he had that's why he had to go preach in hell a, a, a compartment of hell at least yes uh, and uh the so this third baptism is very much a mystery and even she uh doesn't have a very clear interpretation of it uh but it's related to christ's death and maybe his descent uh into hell are you a twin peaks fan at all twin peaks do you do you are you a twin peaks fan twin peaks i i don't understand oh it's a it's like a it's like a mini series in a movie by David Lynch. Oh no, I I don't know it. Well, <laughs> I Well, there's this the movie's called Twin Peaks Fire Walk with Me and there's this continual reference to uh there's a there's a very cryptic poem that pervades it and I I'm wondering if this fire baptism and f the fire walk with me are somehow connected. So, David Lynch is an alchemist. He's he's obviously getting this from somewhere and I'm wondering now that you've brought up this fire baptism, if it's somehow connected, I think in in uh, Annick de Souzenel's uh, interpretation of the fire baptism, as she's also inspired by Jung, uh, I think it's very much related to the individuation process, and uh, in uh, Jung's individuation process, you you have the part which consists in to taking back projections. So what you, what, what you experience in the world, you realize it's part of yourself. And uh, I think her concept of the baptism of fire is very much related to this, is how you, um, as you experience life, you realize that nothing is outside from you. That the consequences of this are vast. Sophie, are you outside of me? Or are, <laughs> are, 
<laughs> are you just a projection of my unconscious? Yes. <laughs> you're, you're 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 a real person, aren't you, Sophie? Yes, perhaps. <laughs> oh, perhaps. <laughs> perhaps. Uh oh. I'm dreaming. I'm dreaming. Um, like uh, like Blake and Swedenborg. Yes. And yes. Jacob. <laughs> and, and Descartes. And Descartes as well. Yeah. And Neo. Yes. So, yes. Yes. <laughs> so we have a perhaps I'm a real person from Sophie. Well, I have to say, if you are one of the Truman Show actors, you are one of the better ones that have been sent into my life. I will say this. So, so, so nice job, Kristoff. Um, so this, uh, it's not really, it's kind of the penultimate line because we have this note, but, but in Milton, the father is destiny, the son, a ratio of the five senses and the Holy Ghost vacuum. I mean, everything that we've said before, I think should be discernible. I just went through here and I found the actual verses uh, that uh, he's referencing when it comes to uh, uh, this, this line, Father is destiny. Um, so from Paradise Lost, he says, My overshadowing spirit and might with thee, I send along, ride forth and bid the deep within appointed bounds be heaven and earth. Boundless the deep, because I am who fill infinitude, nor vacuous to space. Though I uncircumscribe myself, retire, and put not forth my goodness, which is free to act or not, necessity and chance, approach not me, and what I will is fate. So spake the Almighty, and to what he spake his word, the filial Godhead gave effect. So we have the Holy Ghost there filling the vacuum, as well as Father being fate and destiny. And as far as the sum of ratio of the five sentences, there's only two passages really in Paradise Lost about this. And the one here, some I have chosen of peculiar grace, elect above the rest, so is my will. The rest shall hear me call and oft be warned, their sinful state into a, to appease betimes. The incensed deity while offered grace invites, for I will clear their senses dark. What may suffice and soften stony hearts to pray, repent, and bring obedience due to prayer, repentance, and obedience due, though but endeavored with sincere intent. My ear shall not be slow, my eye not shut, and I will place within them as a guide my umpire conscience, whom if they will hear, life after light, well used, they shall attain, and to the end, persisting safe, arrive. So I think these are all, um, you know, we, so the sun, a ratio of the five senses, we have this I take that to be that umpire of the consciousness. So I think these are the passages that Blake is referring to in Paradise Lost. There might be more that I missed, but I, I believe this, that covers it. And I already sort of gave my interpretation of what I thought the note meant. And to be honest, Sophie, we've been going for about an hour. We may only get through uh, this today because I'm, I'm pretty tired and need to rest a little bit, but we can keep going if you want. Um, do you want to close out and say anything about this note? Uh, or, or the penultimate line? Um, I think it's important that Blake is mentioning uh, the, the fact that Milton was a poet because I think, like we said, the, the, poet, the poetic genius is really the central theme of this poem, I think. And uh, we will see this uh, in the next episodes yeah. of this podcast. You know, what's amazing is to, is, you know, I, I, I did uh, the Divine Comedy this year. I read that and doing Paradise Lost. It's interesting how we forget that Dante and Milton are poets and we tend to take what they say about the biblical narrative and twist it. And there's a, there's a, they include a lot of unbiblical things within their interpretation of the Bible. And it's, uh, it's really interesting how what we understand the Bible to be actually saying gets jumbled together with these poetical works that are presupposing the Bible. And I just think to myself, to go back to fire, 
how dangerous that is. Like I'm trying to get in the mind of a, of a Dante or a Milton, you know, obviously they had read the Bible. Obviously they were very familiar with it, but why they would try to explain it or elaborate upon it or kind of insert things into it that weren't there. You know, I I'm wrong about a lot of things in the Bible. And I always say, don't listen to me, go read it yourself because I don't want to lead anybody astray as I'm working out my own salvation. But Milton and Dante really didn't have any problem with taking liberties with the Bible. And I have to, that, that's the hubris that's involved with that. As great as I think, I especially like Paradise Lost. I actually like it better than Divine Comedy. But I think about that and I was like, I, I would never do that. The risk is so high for error and you could lead so many people astray. Like why even tamper with it, you know? Yes, I, I would like to, to end this uh, episode by linking the three persons uh, I talked about. There, there is a common point between Swedenborg, uh, Annick de Susanel, who is still alive, and uh, Leonard Cohen, because the three of them read the, the Bible in original Hebrew uh, language. And the, uh, Leonard, Cohen was, uh, Leonard Cohen was like Blake, he was a poet in himself. And uh, I think the Hebrew langu language is a poetic language, and uh, Blake is going to to write about this in the uh, in the rest of this poem, there is a, a passage about the prophets, uh, uh, which are and David, King David, which Blake considers as a as a poet, and we we could say the same of Leonard Cohen. He uses the Bible as an inspiration for his songs. And uh, I think they have a, a similar approach to it. And maybe it's the Hebrew uh, culture, which is more, uh, which is more appropriate for a poetic interpretation. Well, I'll tell you this: when the you know I can't read Hebrew or Greek, but <clears throat> when you get into a concordance and you look at the actual original language and its potential interpretations, you know, you can, you can get five, 10, 15 meanings for a word that drastically change what the passage is that's being communicated to you. So one could easily argue that I have a, um, impoverished understanding of what the Bible says, because I can only read it in English and I primarily read the King James. So, you know, if I, if I knew the Hebrew and the Greek, maybe I would not see what Dante and Milton and others have done as being so dangerous. But to me, I just don't have that grasp of the language. And maybe if I did, I would, I'd be able to see those worlds that they see. Yes. Less, well, the essay, maybe I, uh, we could link it in the yeah, podcast. Send, or... send it to me. Yeah. I think, yes, I could send it again to you about the William Blake and uh, Leonard Cohen. And they insist that Hebrew is really appropriate for poetry. It's really a, a language, as you said, which has many interpretations. So it's very a language which uh, make people think poetically more than maybe English or French. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, yeah, I agree. I agree. All right, well, let's, do you mind if we, we call it a day there? I know we only got through the second portion of the poem, but we had a lot to say. And I feel like, I, f I feel like we've given people a lot to digest and maybe we'll come back and do the, do the Proverbs of Hell and Memorable Fancy next time. Yes, we could do this. All right. Thank you so much, Sophie. And thank you, everybody, for listening. I'll have this up and 
edited later tonight. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you.